When is a mace better than a sword? Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiator. Now, what we're going to look at here is, first of all, when a mace might be better than a sword in a civilian setting, and secondly, when a mace might be better than a sword in a military medieval, this is me medieval military setting. Um, so battlefield stuff, or indeed civilian life stuff. Before we jump into those points, I just want to make the point that I have always argued that the sword is a superior weapon in most situations, and in most types of warfare, and in most types of civilian self-defense as well. And the fundamental uh, fact is, uh, and I've done a dedicated video just for this point. The fact is that the sword, generally speaking, is uh, more nimble. It's longer, usually. It's got edges on both sides and a point, or at least one edge and a point. It usually has some form of hand protection. It balances closer to the hand, which is what gives us its nimbleness. And frankly, any kind of hit or poke with one of these is going to wound someone, certainly in a civilian setting through normal clothes. Whereas a what's essentially a heavy club or cudgel, even if it's a fancy flanged mace like this, for the most part, you can hit someone in lots of parts of their body and it will hurt a lot and it might even break bones, it might even injure them but it's not normally going to lead to imminent death unless you hit them in the head. Um, so by and large, this kind of longer, more nimble weapon that is also edged all around and pointed is generally speaking better in most types of dueling scenarios or even self-defense scenarios. And this is to some degree, you could argue, more easy to wear as well um, by virtue of having a scabbard for it. However, I want, to ha I want the mace to have its day in the sun and I want it to have some share of the glory because the fact is that maces were were quite extensively used in the medieval period and in fact all the way through into the Renaissance and we could say uh, through certainly to certain sort of tribal groups and ethnographic groups all the way through to the modern world. Um, you know, if we're looking at stone-headed um, North American Indian war clubs, for example, or uh, Indian or Persian maces, and so on and so forth. So clubs and maces have basically been around forever and they do the job, they get the job done. But what's interesting is when we look at the medieval period, despite the fact that swords were extensively um, extensively used and owned by really every end of society, by the time we get to about 1000 AD, pretty much anyone who um, might find themselves going to war could find that they could afford a sword. You know, certainly by the time we get to the 1200s, swords are incredibly common, so common that common civilians living in cities were, had fencing schools and were practicing sword and buckler fencing, so much so that in London and Paris, they actually had to bring in laws to limit the uh, carriage of these sorts of weapons in the streets and indeed limit the activities of the fencing clubs teaching how to use them. But despite the uh, universal access to the sword and the fact that the sword was so popular and so widely used. The fact is that the mace did come about certainly by the time of the uh, second, third crusade, they start to become more common. Okay, so we're talking about the uh, the 1000s and 1100s. And indeed, yes, of course, we do see these earlier as well. There are earlier forms of, you know, early medieval mace. We do see uh, a club carried by Bishop Odo on the Bayer Tapestry. Maybe that's the old uh, badge of authority. We know going all the way back to Egyptian times and Babylonian times that maces were carried as badges of authority. But additionally, there's this added element that in Christian society in uh, medieval Europe, there was an idea that using a weapon that wouldn't spill Christian blood was somehow more virtuous. I, I'm not sure that I've ever bought into that idea personally. But anyway, um, the fact is that maces, particularly in the as we get into the middle of the medieval period and through the way to the, the end of the medieval period and into the Renaissance, they actually become common. You could say they even become more common. So the question is, what are the advantages of these? Number one in civilian life and number two in military life. But before we carry on, we're going to have a quick word about the sponsors for this video, who are My Heritage, who are a fantastic family history research site. And I've got a very, very special offer for you down below. That is a free 14 day trial, but more about that in a second. Now, My Heritage is the biggest family history research resource online um, in Europe. It's absolutely massive. Regular viewers of the channel will know that I'm a big fan of family history research. In fact, so much that I've started a playlist um, recently uh, to look into family history research. I love family history. I love history. 
And when it's personally connected to you, I think it's even more interesting to most people. It doesn't matter whether someone in your family has already done loads of research or whether you're coming completely new to it with minimal amounts of data. You will be able to find out more about your family history and DNA if you choose to go down that route as well through MyHeritage. Not only is MyHeritage trusted by over 90 million users worldwide, but in addition it's also got tools, for example photographic um, kind of enhancement, colorization, even animation tools as well. So you can take photos of members of your family from the past and you can bring them back to life and restore them as well. So this is my great great grandfather in the 1870s I'm guessing and look, oh it's gonna colorize it. Oh wow! And repair as well. We're gonna repair and colorize. Wow, this is really exciting. <laughs> That's amazing. So obviously I don't know what the... Wow, look at that. Look at that before and after. And there is the enhanced version of that image, which I think looks absolutely incredible. So using the link right below this video down here, you can get a 14 day free trial of all the features of MyHeritage and get playing around with it, have a bit of fun with it. Um, why not try it out? And if you decide to continue uh, your subscription, then you're gonna get a 50% discount after that. So whether you would just want to use it free for 14 days, that's fine, or you want to continue using it, you still get a 50% discount after that. So I hope this has been useful and uh, check out that link right now. So first of all, we're going to look at the advantages of the mace in civilian life. Now, before I go into the, this particular um, aspect, I want to just say that primarily I do view these as advantageous in a military context. So I think we're kind of clutching at straws a little bit, looking for advantages, uh, advantages of these in the civilian context. If we're purely looking about efficiency of a weapon, for people to use who aren't wearing armour, who are just going about their business. The fact is we know that swords were most popular for self-defence and daggers and knives. However, maces were used in the civilian world in the medieval period. The question is why? Well, first of all, badge of office. So often on this channel, I just look at weapons from a point of view of uh, the efficiency of the weapon, how do you use it, techniques, these kinds of things. But we also have to remember that medieval society was extremely structured. Um, common medieval people, obviously most of them were religious and uh, equally there was a very uh, specific ordering to society with different social classes and different expectations of those classes. And then there was the so-called um, different estates. So there was the clergy, there was the knighthood and nobility, there was the king and there were the the common people, the workers. And the fact is that the mace, for, for numerous reasons going all the way back into um, the ancient world, the mace was a badge of office. So much so that even today in the United Kingdom's parliament, we still see a mace carried in parliament as a symbol of the crown's authority. So maces of various types were carried to symbolise sometimes the ecclesiastical world, the church world's um, kind of authority, but equally they were carried by monarchs as well and sometimes by um, nobles. So there is a symbolic purpose to the mace and honestly we don't really know exactly where this comes from, but there is a symbolism attached to the mace, as I say, going all the way back into the ancient world and you can see it even in ancient Egypt. We also see maces carried in the medieval world, particularly in England and France as far as I've researched, and I'm sure this was true in other places as well, by crown officials who are kind of precursors to what we would now call the police. Obviously the police didn't exist then in the modern form, but there were officials who enforced the law. And we know that in some cases they did carry maces. Now, of course, in the um, modern or relatively modern world, this would come into the police truncheon. But that brings us back to a more practical sense as well. It means that you can mete out justice with one of these. You can fell someone, incapacitate someone, break their limbs, knock them out without necessarily killing them. Now, in a modern sense, we could describe that as, oh, the mace is brilliant because it's a non-lethal weapon. And certainly we'd apply that to something like a truncheon. You can uh, incapacitate someone, you can break their hands, you can break their limbs. Even if you're attacked with uh, you know, a knife or a broken bottle or something like this, you can potentially defend yourself and take the opponent out with a truncheon. Some people might argue that if you're using something more akin to a mace, you're more likely to kill the person, even if by accident, and that's definitely true. 
And so I think we have to be a little bit careful uh, when we're talking about maces as non-lethal things, because clearly if you hit someone in the head with one of these, it's probably going to be fairly lethal a lot of the time. And remember also, of course, that all around the world, at the same time as medieval maces were being used, other people were using forms of war club um, and, uh, yeah, knob carry and all sorts of things, and completely lethally all the time. So I don't want you to uh, take from this that Matt Easton says that maces are non-lethal weapons. But that being said, I do think that, again, if we look at the medieval psyche, there was some degree of um, reluctance to take human life where it wasn't seen as just and that might bring upon your head eternal damnation. Um, so a, a, an official who was trying to capture a, a pickpocket, for example, I do think to some extent, if you broke their legs or, or smacked them around the head, uh, rather than stabbing them with a sword or chopping them through the body with a sword or whatever, I do think there was probably an inherent preference towards that because it was seen as trying to capture the person, bring them to trial, this kind of thing. So I think it's more complicated than just saying it's a non-lethal weapon because maces at the time weren't really non-lethal, so, so to speak. But I do think there's a... Uh, uh, ethical and religious separation, and that's why we see Bishop Odo carrying a, a club, there's a separation between using a sword on someone who's an enemy, uh, who might be decreed an enemy by the Pope or someone else, and using a mace on one of your own citizens um, in a completely different type of, you know, peaceful civilian context. So, in the civilian world, I think one of the advantages of maces is not necessarily that they were non-lethal weapons, but they were less lethal weapons. And I do think that they were viewed symbolically very differently to swords and spears and crossbows and things like this. So before I jump into looking at some specific advantages of the mace over the sword in a military context, what I want to first mention is something which applies to both civilian and military. And that is that the mace is fundamentally kind of indestructible. Now, you can't say that of many weapons. This is a purely metal mace. It's got a tubular metal shaft. This is quite a late, you know, end of the 15th century and really 16th century type of flanged mace. But there were types of mace which had wooden handles, but they're relatively short and they're very robust. And there were other types which would have metal handles in the 15th century as well. But whether it's the wooden handle type or the metal handle type, the fact is that maces, by, the, by their very construction and their size, are to all intents and purposes kind of indestructible. They're as strong as a hammer is used, you know, repeatedly to hammer um, uh, hot metal on an anvil. That, that, they're a completely robust object. Now, some of you might think that's true of all other weapons. It's certainly not true of all other weapons. The fact is that in the medieval world, they didn't have 5160 or EN45 or 1095 steel. They had whatever steel that they could make and get hold of or import. And so there was a lot, there was a lot of very vari variable quality in sword blades at the time. And it was often what we would call slaggy steel. That is, there's slag and other impurities in the steel. To boil this down into simple terms, swords broke. And I don't think swords broke that infrequently either. Um, the, the fact is, if we look at medieval art, we see broke, broken swords quite often, and we read about broken swords in the sources. Um, I mean, breaking swords is even in the Arthurian myth as well. So sword blades could break and did break. Okay, so that's a fundamental weakness of swords. And it's not just true of Europe. It's also mentioned in Middle Eastern sources as well. Even if we go to something like the uh, poleaxe, which seems like a very big and powerful weapon, and it is, but the fact is that they went to enormous lengths, in this case via langets, as they're called, these um, steel or iron splints running down the outside, to keep that bit attached to that bit. Uh, and again, if we look at medieval art, we see broken poleaxes, we see broken spears, we see broken halberds, lances, obviously, to some extent, are designed to break. So the fact is that numerous types of very, very common medieval weapon broke uh, and didn't necessarily break rarely. However, how often did maces break? Extremely rarely, I would think. And I think that's worth mentioning, that the mace is essentially an unbreakable weapon, or near enough to unbreakable weapon. So how is the mace superior to the sword, in, or at least from a certain perspective, in military life in combat essentially whether it's um one-on-one -on -one duels in the barriers 
knightly duels to the death, trial by combat, or whether it's on the battlefield, skirmishing, fighting on ships, sieges, whatever. This type of to the death, potentially, type of combat. What ways are the mace superior? Well, fundamentally, the most obvious way, and the way I want to, um, the thing that I want to fixate on, is it is easier to use against an opponent in armour. What do I mean about um, by that? Well, quite simply, if your opponent is wearing full plate harness, the sword was never really designed, at its outset, to deal with that. The sword has fine cutting edges designed to cut through clothing and meat and bone, and it has a point. Now, indeed, swords did adapt, obviously, to deal with armour as armour developed. Okay, so there was a um, an arms race between the weapons and the armour. And obviously things like the Polacks came along and developed, particularly in the 15th century, in order to sort of maximise the effect you could have with a weapon against an opponent in plate harness. But fundamentally the sword is a backup weapon most of the time. Not always, but most of the time. And it's not particularly easy to take out an armoured opponent in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries with a sword. Why? because your cuts are going to have basically no effect. They'll have some, some degree of energy transference with a hit, like hitting with a heavy walking stick, I guess. Uh, but fundamentally, it is all about the point of the sword and wrestling. Those, those, those make up like 90% of all of the um, armoured sword techniques. And these are more or less difficult, especially if the opponent's trying to do the same thing to you. So... You've got to try and get your point into some gap between the plates, which very likely might be filled with mail, aka chain mail, as well. So not only do you, are you fighting trying to defend yourself, but you're trying to get your point into somewhere where the armour isn't. And once you've got it in there, you've still got to get through mail very often, not always, but very often as well. So armpits, backs of knees, into the groin, any openings around the helmet, back of the neck, this kind of thing. So you're looking for gaps and that's very difficult when the opponent's doing the same thing to you and fighting against you. In wrestling, this can be used as a lever. Again, the opponent's trying to do the same things to you. And yes, indeed, sometimes you can turn the sword around and use the back end to, uh, to strike with like a hammer. But again, that's essentially using it as a mace. Now, if we come to the mace on the other hand, how does the mace wound the person in armour by just hitting them really hard. <laughs> and so fundamentally, you can hit them anywhere on the body, okay? It doesn't really matter whether you're giving a massive strike to the head, or a massive strike to the knee, a massive strike to their hand, the gauntlet, uh, their, their elbow, whatever. Wherever you hit, it's going to have some percussive effect on them. Way more effect striking than you would with a sword. And if we come back to the strength of materials again, remember this is basically an indestructible weapon that you can put maximum strength into hitting as hard as you possibly can into any part of the opponent's body that's covered with armour. And repeatedly, over and over again, hammering away with this massive iron club. If you do that with the sword, what's going to happen? You're not going to wound them, you're not going to cut through, you might hurt them, you might injure them, you might bruise them, and there's a really big chance your sword will break. The simple fact is, if you take a sword, even like this Albion, made of modern steel, modern heat treatment, probably harder at the edge than the average medieval sword, great quality, but if I strike someone, one of my friends, or I get one of my friends to strike me in my plate armour on the helmet, as hard as they physically can, like this, they're going to put a bit of a notch in the helmet, they might put a dent, it'll probably ring my bell a bit and make me a little bit stunned for a second, but there's a fair chance this blade will break, okay? If you repeatedly smash armour with a sharp-edged sword, you're certainly going to lose the edge. You're certainly going to use, get chips and burrs and um, rolls and all this kind of stuff. But there's a really good chance that on the first, you might lose a chip. And on the second blow, the whole blade's going to snap. So, one of the fundamental and the main and obvious advantage to a mace is you can just hit as hard as you can anywhere on the opponent's armour with abandon, which you cannot do with a sword. Now, another advantage of the mace, uh, and you can apply this to comparing it against things like uh, war hammers or pole axes or anything like this, is it can't get stuck. I've made a big uh, point over the last few months talking about spiked weapons and how effective they are. So things like war hammers and picks and things like this, how effective they are 
But the, one of the downsides is they can get stuck. If you're hitting into someone who's not wearing armor, your weapon can get stuck. If you're hitting against someone who is wearing armor, the weapon can get stuck. Um, so the simple fact is that with a mace, it's not gonna get stuck. It's either gonna hit solidly and stop, at which point you can reload for another blow, or it's gonna glance off, in which case you carry on anyway. So it's not gonna get stuck in anything. Related to that is the point that it is multi-directional. Um, in order to strike with the most energy, usually you'll find that strikes are in the direction that you would be cutting with an edge anyway, but you can give strikes which move laterally, sideways from either side, that with a sword would be a hit with the flat, uh, but with a mace, it's the same thing. There is no flat, there is no edge. You can hit from any direction. The main advantage I actually see of that is the fact that with something like an axe or a warhammer, we talked about glancing. When we hit armor and it glances off, it's not, it's not difficult, and it can happen with swords as well, for the edge or the direction of the point or the blade to get knocked off. And then when you hit them again, you're hitting them with the flat. With a mace, that cannot happen. If it, gets, if it gets turned in your hand, well, it's unlikely it'll get turned in your hand because it doesn't have any leverage to get turned. But if it does get turned in your hand, it makes absolutely no difference. And again, that makes for ease of attack. It means that when you're striking someone with as much force and abandon, you don't have to think about edge alignment. You don't have to think about if it glances off, what do I do? You can just hit from any old angle. You can hit sideways uh, around here. You can attack from angles that sometimes you might not be able to get an edge to come from. Um, you know, down at the knee, up at the head, wherever. You can just be looking at openings without having to worry about what your weapon's orientation is doing. Now, the last major advantage of the mace that I want to mention is that it breaks stuff. Now, that might seem really, really obvious because that's what most weapons are designed to do. They're usually designed to break people, aren't they? But the mace, by its very virtue, being hammer-like, essentially, but with a multi-direction hammer, because it's got so much inertia at the tip and its mass is all at the, the what would be the back end for a sword, a sword's that way around and a mace is that way around, it means that it has an enormous ability and robustness, remember we mentioned also that it's basically an unbreakable weapon, to smash other stuff. Now normally we'd be thinking about armour. So indeed, we often uh, so far have been looking at hitting someone in armour and thinking about the damage that it does to them inside the armour, that is wounding them through the armour, through percussive effect. But think about what's happening to the armour as well. Now, if we look at plate harness, you look at the articulations at the elbows, at the knees, the fold, that's the, the skirt below the, the upper thorax of the, of the cuirass, uh, articulations of the visor, for example, or the bever, um, if you've got a gorget or wrapper, all sorts of different bits of armor. If you smash those things really hard, especially if it hits an articulating rivet or a lame, uh, where a lame overlaps another lame, if you hit any of those things really hard with a mace, there's a really good chance that you're either gonna pop a rivet, bend a lame so it conflicts with another one so the part doesn't move anymore. So, not only can you break the armor, but you can also make the armor stop working in the way that's intended. If you hit someone really hard in the knee, yes indeed, you might really badly injure their knee, but they might find that not only have they got an injured knee, but they can't bend the armor of their polane of their knee anymore. So this has the ability to break bits of armor, but moreover, and this is something which doesn't get mentioned an awful lot, uh, but it is mentioned in, I think it's a Persian or Mamluk treatise, I can't remember which, but uh, anyway, North African or Middle Eastern treaties, Smashing swords, that's right. So it is explicitly mentioned that if your opponent has a sword and you have a mace, you're both in armor, you can specifically target the blade of their sword. Now, this is an um, Islamic world sword we're talking about here, so it's probably, if it's a good sword, it will be the equivalent of Wootz, Damascus steel. But they're often edge hardened and they're not necessarily uh, spring tempered like uh, certainly like modern um, replicas of medieval swords are and how a lot of the original medieval swords were. So indeed you could strike it, the blade may flex and might survive. But if it's not through tempered, um, then you might find that the blade bends and stays bent. Uh, however, if it's a harder blade and it does flex, it might just be that you hit it hard enough that it snaps. So. 
When you're striking the sword, not only, and obviously you've got to mention the guard as well, not only might you break the guard, but you could break the, or bend the blade. Now swords are probably amongst some of the most fragile weapons that were being used regularly on the battlefield at this time, and so it's understandable why they talk about breaking swords, but theoretically this could apply to certain other weapons as well. But anyway, swords for the most part, Yes, you can break armor. Yes, you can potentially break swords also with the mace. So that's definitely a point uh, towards the mace's favor. So to finish off, so it doesn't just look like I'm completely extolling all of the virtues of the mace, I want to show some of the counterpoints that people might think about. Oh, but, but the mace can't do this or can't do that. And I'm gonna give my potential retorts to those things. So the first one is that fundamentally, the mace cannot thrust. Well, some maces do have points at the end, so some maces can thrust. However, I think it's fair to say they don't have such a slender or long point as a sword or a comparable weapon has. And so, yes, that is true. They can't thrust. However, if you're fighting in armour, the primary attack is trying to get the, the point into gaps. But as I've already shown, that's technically quite challenging when the opponent's trying to fight you and they're trying to do the same thing to you. Whereas if you've got a mace that you can literally just hit anywhere on the opponent's body and it might have an effect on either their armor or them, that's very much easier. So yes, indeed, it's not a great thrusting weapon, even if you could add a point on the end, and some of them do have points, and you could half sword with it. Half sorting is relatively te technical and relatively difficult compared to striking. When we come into the civilian situation or a lightly armoured or non-armoured situation, I have always said and I've always agreed the sword is the superior weapon. It's more nimble, it's longer, it has an edge all around and it has a point on it. So yes, absolutely. I do think that the mace really excels in an armoured fighting context. Now the next thing against the mace that someone might say is, but Matt, the, uh, the mace doesn't have anything like such a long reach as a sword has. Um, yeah, that's kind of true. However, remember with a sword like this, so we're comparing like with like, they're both one-handed weapons. Um, the actual central percussion and the optimum cutting portion of the blade is about here. Um, so actually, if we put where the hand would be holding the mace, it's actually not as different as you might think. But my main answer to that point would be, in armor, it's actually not that important because in armor, it's not so much about reach um, because you can basically close in in armor far more safely and effectively than you can do out of armor. So indeed, when I talk about use of weapons out of armor in a civilian duel, for example, reach is one of the most important things. It's why the spear is so much superior over the sword. But in armor, that completely changes because in armor, you now have the ability to get in really, really close. And of course, in medieval warfare, we know that this is the distance at which they were normally finding themselves fighting anyway because they were in a squashed in melee. So actually shorter weapons, and in some, time, in some cases shorter swords, were actually preferred over longer ones fighting in armor. And indeed, very often they'd drop the sword and just pull the rondel dagger out because of the close range. So the reach point, certainly for armored fighting, doesn't really stand up. Now, something else that someone might say against the mace is that it is slow or poor in defense. We don't actually know an awful lot technically about how maces were used. There are no treatises for mace use. Well, it's not totally true. There are treatises which mention maces, but they don't go into an awful lot of detail. Compared to the thousands of pages of um, advice we've got about how to use swords from this period, and that's largely, of course, because the treatises are looking at dueling weapons. But, um, and also you could say to, a, to some extent as well, this is just a weapon for hitting people with. That's not to say you couldn't defend with it. So a lot of the defensive actions you do with a sword, whether it's a simple uh, cover, coverter as um, Fiore would call it, or a, a block, a parry, or whether it's a rabat type movement where you're knocking something off to the side. So a, an active defense or a passive defense, some people might call it. You can do either of those with, with the mace. And yes, it is a bit more slow and cumbersome, but you can do either of the, those things. I mean, actually, we see what seems to be one of the horsemen in Paolo Ocello's uh, Battle of San Romano painting, one of them anyway, there's three parts, uh, using a warhammer in that way to knock aside an opponent's uh, sword. At least that's possibly what it's showing. Um, so you can do a lot of the sword techniques with these, but yes, it is slower, it is more cumbersome, because of course it's a top-heavy weapon that hits with a lot of force. 
However, I would also say if you were using this unarmoured, you can use some of the dagger techniques to defend with. So if someone did uh, swing a sword at you, for example, you don't have to use your mace like it's a sword. You can use it in the same ways you'd use some of the dagger defences or indeed like half swording. So the other thing to say, of course, is usually and certainly in war, these were being used in the 15th and 16th centuries by people wearing full plate harness. So often the best way to defend yourself would be to stick your armor in the way. So if someone swung a sword at your head, well, you wouldn't care because you're wearing your armor. And you just, you just charge in and smash them in the head or knee or wherever. Um, however, if they swung something a bit more potent at your head, then again, you can just come back to the sword techniques. You can cover as you come in in the same way you would do with a sword. You can augment the armor and the weapon together. Um, you can maybe go for an arm wrap or whatever, as well as then um, smashing off. There's a whole bunch of techniques you can do. So yes, they are a bit slower in defense, but, uh, and again, they're indestructible, remember, as well. So bam, you can stop a pole axe swing with one of these held like that, no problem. Um, so I don't think that they are bad in defense. You just have to use them slightly differently to a sword. And the final thing I think someone might commonly say against the mace as opposed to the sword is that it's tiring to use. And I don't disagree fundamentally, but my counter is certainly in armor, it is more potent with each hit. So we talked about how difficult it is at fighting in armor to try and find an opening to get your point in. You're at very close range, the opponent's trying to do the same, you're basically wrestling at the sword, trying to find somewhere to stick a point. It's quite technical, quite difficult. Whereas, any old idiot with lots of muscles can thrash away with one of these in armour, and it will be really quite nasty to deal with for the other person, because they can just hit, just hit with this thing like a bludgeon. And so, yes, it's more tiring, but overall, I think each swing of this thing, or each movement of this thing, is gonna have a more productive effect in an armoured fight than the sword probably would. I hope that's been thought provoking and given you a bit more respect for the mace. Not at all to detract from the qualities of swords and in certain situations, swords are clearly superior weapons. But I do think in other situations, the mace can be the superior weapon. So as always, guys, you know, it comes down to context. Uh, but certainly if I was fighting in armor and it, it, I would uh, very often uh, consider taking one of these, especially if I had something like a hand pavis or something else for my left hand, uh, or I might just use the left hand for grabbing and grappling, which is also a pretty damn useful thing to do, especially if you're wearing full plate harness. And why not wear a sword as well? You Why not both? <laughs> um, but the fact is that the one that I might have in my hand for fighting in armor, I yeah, I would really consider having one of these or a warhammer or something like that, but I would not at all be unhappy with a flanged mace fighting in armor. And do you know what? To a certain degree, I think it's easier. I think it's an easy way to fight in armor against another armored opponent compared to half swording with a long sword or an arming sword. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Please give a like. Please subscribe if you haven't done already. Remember, check out all the links below and I'll see you back on the channel really soon again. Cheers, folks.